Uh, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at, at uh, CAFC, and it's been my pleasure to be working with the CIHR team in children's pain for a couple of years now to bring this webinar series on, on children's pain. Um, today's uh, The title of today's session is Making It Happen, How Clinicians Are Improving Pain Practices on the Front Line. And before we're going to be having uh, four presenters. We have uh, Melanie Barwick, Kim Widger, Kathy O'Leary, and, and Dee Wilson, who will all be presenting. Um, and we will be taking questions throughout the uh, the session after presenters, as well as having a, hopefully having a discussion at the end of the session. We do have this session uh, scheduled for an hour and a half. We often, if, if the presenters are able, sometimes the question and, uh, period extends past that hour and a half. We do record these, so if the presenters are able to stay on and answer a few questions over the over the the allotted time, uh, we are recording this. So if uh, if the attendees have to leave, then by all means do that. We are recording this, and we will. Uh, show, uh, display these uh, presentations on the Knowledge Exchange Network, which we have up on the screen. We have all of the Children's Pain uh, series posted up there, so you can go back and see any of the previous sessions, uh, we, including the first one uh, way back in uh, uh, 2010, I think was when we did the first one. Uh, the, this session will be posted here. We have, it'll, the video will be posted in the middle of the page here, and you can see more information such as the presenter's bios at, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, before we get started, uh, one of the things that we're never sure is exactly how big the audience is. We can only see the number of lines that are connected, and we do know that uh, many of the centers have uh, this being projected in, in a conference room. So uh, with, you know, it's often as many as 30 or 40 people sitting in the room that to us only appears as one line. So we'd like to, if uh, just to get people uh, used to the interface and get them out of their chairs and already moving a little bit, uh, if we could get you to type into the question box, just type in a number, uh, the number of people who are watching with you, and that'll, uh, whether it's by yourself, just type in one, or if you have one or two people in your office with you, or if you're in a room of, of 10 or 15 or 20 in, in a conference room, uh, just type that into the into the question box and let us know how many people are, are out there, and that'll give us a, a better idea of what kind of an audience uh, we're dealing with here. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand the presentation over to our initial presenters, uh, Kim Widger and Melanie Barwick. Uh, Kim is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Hospital for Sick Children and the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at University of Toronto. She's currently working with uh, Dr. Bonnie Stevens, who's the uh, lead of the CIHR team in children's pain. Uh, Kim's research focuses on knowledge translation and end-of-life pain management for children. And she was previously a clinical nurse specialist with the Pediatric Palliative Care Service at the IWK Health Center in Halifax. And Melanie is a registered psychologist and associate scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. She's the Scientific Director of Knowledge Translation at the hospital and is affiliated with both the Learning and Research Institutes. Melanie's program of research focuses on implementation science and knowledge translation, and she's an associate uh, professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the Dalla Lana School of Public Health at University of Toronto. So without uh, further ado, I'm just going to hand the screen over to uh, Kim and... Uh, uh, Melanie. So over to you, Kim. Great. Thank you very much, Doug. So as Doug said, our uh, talk this morning for most of you is making it happen, how clinicians are improving pain practices on the front line. And our objectives for this session... Sorry, are, are to share the practical aspects of implementing a knowledge translation intervention to improve the assessment and management of procedural pain in infants, children, and adolescents. And as part of this, we'll be demonstrating how a KT casebook can be used to facilitate this process. So just a bit of an outline in terms of what we'll be doing over the next hour or so. First of all, I'll be describing the background of the study that this casebook uh, is based upon. Melanie will tell you a little bit about the casebook methodology overall. Then we'll have Kathy and Dee share stories of how they implemented the knowledge translation uh, strategy within their units. And then we'll talk overall about the key lessons that were learned across all of the sites who took part in the study that we'll be talking about. So just in terms of some background, hospitalized children undergo multiple painful procedures for diagnostic and treatment purposes. Now there's actually a lot of research out there that says what we should be doing to improve pain practices and reduce children's pain. 
However, what we found is that pain practices are actually suboptimal in uh, healthcare settings. So we think this is due to some inefficiency in how knowledge has been translated into practice in the past. So to address this gap between the research evidence and clinical practice, the CIHR team in children's pain, which is led by Dr. Bonnie Stevens at the Hospital for Sick Children, evaluated the impact of an interactive multidimensional knowledge translation intervention, which is known as EPIC, for evidence-based practice for improving quality to see if we could make improvements in the assessment and management of acute pain in children. So this was really done over three projects, initially looking at sort of the baseline practices around uh, pain assessment and management in the sites that took part in the study. As well, there's some work around conducting an assessment of the context where uh, pain is experienced by children. And then project three, which is what we'll be focusing on today, was really to implement the EPIC intervention and evaluate its effects compared with a group who receives standard care on improving pain management. So some preliminary results are out from the first project, um, a paper that was published in CMAJ uh, about a year ago now, I think. Uh, and some other forthcoming results. So we'll have links to those uh, once the, this webinar is posted. Um, but as I said, we'll for now just be focusing on project three. So this was called Translating Research on Pain in Children Study, which is otherwise known as TROPIC. So the objectives of uh, this project three or TROPIC was to evaluate the effects of EPIC on acute pediatric pain practices, which is assessment and management, as well as looking at a clinical outcome, which is pain intensity. And the way the study was conducted, there were eight pediatric tertiary care hospitals involved. At each site, there were four units that participated. Two of them received the EPIC intervention and two received standard care. And then a prospective cohort comparative design with repeated measures was used to see whether or not EPIC made a difference. So what is EPIC? Well, EPIC is an interactive, multifaceted CQI strategy that includes, first of all, looking at the baseline information about what um, pain practices are like, uh, and then using that information to help identify the areas that really need improvement, then using research evidence to guide how to make those improvements or what the, the uh, level of care should be looking like. Then having local health professionals get involved, uh, and those were called the research practice councils, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, to have them be involved to develop and implement this tailored KT strategy using continuous quality improvement techniques. And as well, a local clinical research coordinator was uh, a part of the study to actually facilitate this whole process. And most of those were nurses, and I keep referring to them as the research nurses, but there actually was one who was, was not a nurse. So in terms of uh, implementing EPIC, the, the preparation stage actually took about eight months and this involved establishing who would be on this research practice council, which was this interdisciplinary group of health professionals from the unit that was involved in the study, doing some training for them, uh, then having them look at that baseline data and identify their potential practice changes, looking at the existing evidence that was out there and then choosing what they were actually going to target and developing very specific aim statements about how they were um, or what level they wanted to achieve in terms of improvement. And you'll hear much more um, specific examples about this from Dee and Kathy in a few moments. So the Research Practice Council consisted of a wide range of uh, health professionals across all of the sites. Within each unit, there were four to six members, and there was a different process within each unit as to how these people actually came to be on the RPC. So some of them were volunteers, some were chosen, uh, and Kathy and Dee will tell you a bit more about that process as well. So these council members were given a one-day training session to review sources of evidence, knowledge translation strategies that could be used, as well as how to actually do the quality improvement methods. So across the 16 units that received the intervention, 
these are the examples of the practice changes that they chose to focus on and you'll see there's more than 16 because some units actually chose to focus on more than one thing at a time. Then in terms of the implementation phase, this occurred over about an 18 month period and what they did was do a three month rapid cycle and did that four separate times. So each time they would implement their, their knowledge translation strategies, then do some evaluation in the form of chart audits to see how well they were doing. And then they would go back and make changes, revise their aim statements and continue on with another cycle. And that's the process that Kathy and Dee will be telling you about. The kinds of knowledge translation strategies they used just very broadly were reminders, educational materials, educational outreach, and audit and feedback. And again, you'll hear more examples of those in a few minutes. So overall, uh, the key findings from the study itself was that EPIC was effective in improving procedural pain assessment and management practices for hospitalized children in Canada. And we're currently examining whether or not EPIC also impacted on pain intensity for children. So of course we'll be doing the usual publications, presentations, at scientific meetings to share findings about, um, about the impact of EPIC. However, those kinds of publications really only tell a part of the story. What gets left out is the really practical aspects of the process of implementing EPIC and what was learned in that process. So the rest of the story comes from our KT casebook. And this is really the voices from the people on the ground who actually implemented the whole process. So Kathy and Dee were the clinical research coordinators at two different sites who oversee and facilitated the whole process. And they will be sharing their story with you in a minute. But before, um, I'm going to turn it over to Melanie to tell you more about the, the casebook method itself. We'll just have a little question here to see how many people actually have heard of a KT casebook before and have you seen other examples? So you have three options uh, for this poll to say yes I have seen other examples of KT casebooks or I've heard of a KT casebook but I've never actually seen one or really this is the first time I've heard of a KT casebook. So I'll turn it over to Doug to run the poll. Yeah, so everyone, uh, well, lots of people are already starting to vote, so you obviously can see your uh, the question and your answer choices up on the screen. So just uh, uh, click on, on your selection to, to submit it. And for those of you who, there are a number of you watching in a group, you will unfortunately have to come to some kind of consensus on, on your answer choice because <laughs> it can only have uh, one, one choice per line, I guess we'll call it. But I think most of the answers are in nice and quickly, so we'll turn that around. So we've got 77% have said they have not heard of a, K, a KT casebook before this session. 20% have heard of a KT casebook but have never seen one. And only 2% uh, said yes and they've seen other examples. Okay. That's helpful for us to know. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Melanie then to tell you more about casebooks. Uh, Hi, everybody. Um, so interesting finding. Uh, over 70% of you, um, this is a new approach to learning about uh, research evidence and how it actually gets applied in the real world. Uh, first casebook actually was designed and, and uh, came out uh, six years ago in 2006. And what we, what we really liked about the casebook method is that it uh, offered an opportunity for researchers um, and for the practitioners to share their experiences. And um, how it's been used in the past is really to share the experiences of decision makers, practitioners, and or researchers around a particular research that they had conducted. Um, and um, making things a little bit more attractive, perhaps a little bit more plain language and readable and accessible for people to pick up read a story that's actually quite brief in most instances, um, but told uh, from the first person of folks who would actually have the experience of um, changing their practice or conducting research uh, in a particular context. And so it really tells us, it tells a story. Um, and that story, I'm sure you can all appreciate, captures different subtleties of implementing research evidence than what, than what we might typically see in a um, research publication. 
And so I've um, assembled some of the casebook examples, and you can certainly find these very easily on the web uh, using Google. I hadn't included the URL links here, but they're uh, easily accessible on the web, and they're all free. Um, so in 2006, the IHR came out with their first KT casebook, where they assembled from a variety of different research studies um, uh, short stories, uh, first-person accounts of what their experiences were, what they did, what they found, and I think in many instances as well, what the key impacts were, what was the so what about the research that they were conducting. Um, the uh, uh, Institute of Population and Public Health came out um, with their own case book, uh, again in 2006, looking at uh, population and public health knowledge and how that gets uh, brought into action. And uh, then a little bit more recently in 2011, the Saskatchewan Public Health and Evaluation Unit produced a casebook called Innovations in Knowledge Translation, the Sphiru K KT Casebook. And uh, this provided um, different KT strategies, actions, and evaluations to highlight their concrete examples and best practices in knowledge translation occurring across Saskatchewan. Um, other ones that I uh, was able to find come from uh, the cancer care um, area, knowledge translation to improve quality of cancer control in Canada, uh, and the um, RTNA, the Research Transfer Network of Alberta, uh, supported through Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, has produced two KT case books. And again, these are um, uh, collections of uh, research conducted by different researchers um, and uh, showcasing what they actually did on the ground to put <coughs> evidence into practice. Um, in a little earlier, before we started speaking, Kim pointed out um, that you know the existing KT casebooks that I'm talking about and highlighting here are really um, collections of uh, a variety of different research studies. And as far as we know, the KT casebook that we have pulled together through Kim's work with the research nurses and the various teams across Canada. Is, an, is the first example of a KT case book stemming from one particular um, research team, research project. Um, and so I think offers an interesting and somewhat different perspective into the application of the ethic uh, intervention across multiple different sites and what people's experiences were with that. So I'm going to turn things back over to Kim and uh, hope that you will take some time after this call to have a look at uh, the KT uh, casebooks that uh, we've highlighted for you. So just to give you a, a bit of a description about what our casebook will look like, uh, essentially we'll have an, uh, sorry, an introduction to the overall study, which will be much of the same information that I've just presented to you. Then there will be one chapter per study site. So that will be eight different chapters, each written by the research nurse uh, at the site talking about their experiences. And you're, you're going to hear sort of a summary of two of those chapters uh, shortly. Then there'll be a final chapter to really highlight the themes that were across all of the sites. And I'm going to present some of that to you um, once Kathy and Dee have spoken, just to give you a sense of some of the findings from other sites. Now, as Melanie said, our casebook is a bit different in that all of the chapters are related to the same study. And although there's certainly similarities across sites, um, if you were to read all of the chapters, you really will hear that what worked in one setting really did not work in another setting and that need to really be able to tailor what you're doing to fit with where you are and the staff that you're working with. So before, before I turn it over to Kathy and Dee, we'll just do another couple of poll questions. Um, so our casebook is all about um, translating knowledge specific to pediatric pain and as I said um, we know that pediatric pain is not managed as well as it maybe could and should be based on the knowledge that we have. So just wondered from your perspective and you can only pick one, what is the mm -hmm. single biggest barrier to effective knowledge translation about pediatric pain in your institution? So we've only given you a few examples. Do you think it's due to a lack of time, inadequate resources, lack of leadership, lack of knowledge about how to actually do KT, or that staff just really don't see any pain as a priority in their practice. All right, I think we've got most of the answers in. We're going to close this poll and 
looks like uh, the biggest, uh, the largest response was inadequate resources at 34%, followed by lack of knowledge about how to do KT at 28%. Uh, then lack of time uh, was 15%, lack of leadership 13%, and staff do not see pain as a priority was the last at 11%. Okay, great. So just to flip that around uh, the other way, then our next question is, what do you think is the single, single biggest facilitator to effective knowledge translation about pediatric pain? So would it be the presence of a local pain champion, resources specifically designated to pain KT activities, um, having or, uh, embedded in the organizational culture the idea that pain management is a priority and an important or that staff see it as an important component of their role? And the uh, number one answer was, uh, as the biggest facilitator, was the importance is embedded in organizational culture at 35% said that. Uh, and then at 23%, uh, tied at 23% was the presence of a local pain champion or the staff see it as an important component of their role. And finally, at 19% was resources specifically designated to pain uh, KT activities as the biggest facilitator. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So now I'm going to um, introduce Kathy O'Leary. Uh, Kathy is the clinical research nurse coordinator at Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, and she's worked with the CIHR team in children's pain and the evidence in child health to enhance outcomes research team since 2007. Throughout her career as a research nurse, Kathy has been involved in a number of projects focusing on improving the quality of care in acute pediatric healthcare settings and the timely dissemination of healthcare evidence. So Kathy's going to speak first, but I'll introduce Dee now as well. Uh, Dee Wilson is a clinical research nurse coordinator at the BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, and she's worked with the CIHR team in children's pain and the CIHR team in maternal infant care since 2010. Dee is also now a clinical research nurse for the Best Practices Parent-Provider Interactions in Pediatrics Project. She recently received her Master's of Nursing degree from the University of Victoria. So take it away, Kathy. Thanks very much, Kim, and <laughs> thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, I, as Kim said, is I'm the research nurse at the um, at, in Edmonton at the Stollery, um, but I'm actually um, not embedded a, a nurse embedded in the Stollery. I'm actually um, employed through the University of Alberta, so I'm a bit of an outsider um, coming into the hospital, um, being a research nurse. So, and that actually had a bit of an impact on on how. Um, how I was seen as uh, seen by the nurses in in the on the units. Um, I'll give you a bit of background. Oh, it's not it's not flipping forward. <laughs> uh, if you just click on the presentation, you've just sort of switched away to a different application there. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It's not. There we go. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of background on the Stollery, um, Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. It is kind of unique in that it, it's embedded within the University Hospital here, um, and we have quite a large catchment area. And I uh, did check on the website for Stollery, and actually the catchment area is the largest in Canada for a pediatric hospital, um, and it includes northern and central Alberta and BC, northern BC, uh, Northwest Territories, Yukon, and none of it and as well Saskatchewan and Manitoba um, parts uh, for, for some um, issues, children's issues. Um, they do 150,000 patients per year. Um, we did just get a brand new 35-bed uh, emergency department this year. Um, we do a lot of complex cardiac surgeries here and as well we're a major organ transplantation center. Now, in terms of the, the study, the CIHR team in children's pain study, um, we had the four units here at Stollery. Um, the two standard care units that um, we had, one was an oncology, a 13-bed oncology unit, unit and a 27-bed cardiac unit. They were the standard care units, so we didn't really do any kind of um, implementation in those units. We just sort of tracked them um, with some data collection. The two intervention units that we had, one was a critical care unit, a 16-bed uh, critical care unit, and the other was a 23-bed surgical uh, inpatient unit. 
So on the critical care unit, um, the RPC, the Research Practice Council, which were the, the um, staff that, um, um, as Kim said, were the, the ones that sort of led the practice change. On that one, we had a unit manager, we had a clinical nurse educator, we had, I think, a couple of RNs, a, a respiratory uh, technologist. Um, but this um, RPC in the critical care unit had lots of changes over the four cycles and actually was quite unstable in terms of uh, membership. Um, their aim statement had to do with pain assessment. Uh, in the surgical inpatient unit, the RPC um, consisted of a unit manager, a child life, um, a, a physiotherapist, I think we had two RNs, um, physician at the beginning, although the physician towards the end of the study was more on a consultative, uh, in a consultative role rather than actually actively on the RPC. We had an LPN and this group was quite stable in the membership. Um, we, I think we only had one nurse that uh, joined about halfway through to replace the physician that went on the consultative role. Um, and their aim statement had to do with pain management. So if we start, if we go back to the critical care, I'm gonna cover the critical care unit first and then uh, talk about the surgical unit later. Um, if we look at the critical care unit, um, they had to come up with aim statements. So they had to decide what practice change they wanted to focus on. So in the first, very first cycle, uh, they came up with this aim statement um, and it had to do with pain assessment and it was to increase the use and documentation of FLAC and FACES revised pain scales to 50% in non-intubated patients age 4 to 17 with a minimum of one assessment per patient per shift and then they had to set a, a date that they had to do this by. And if you look at by the end of um, the, um, the study, um, cycle 4, their aim statement actually didn't change that much. So really the only thing that changed, they, they still said uh, they wanted to do up to 50% um, and same patient population. It's just that the they wanted to do it at least Q4H. That was the only real change they made over the over the period of the four cycles. Now, why was pain assessment chosen in this unit? Um, according to the baseline data that uh, Kim sort of uh, talked about in her presentation, they did a, a sort of a large data collection at the very beginning and each unit was sort of fed back that data to look at to see where, um, where they could, you know, improve, improve their pain practices. Um, they thought that the frequency of the pain assessment in their unit was not being done often enough and they needed to increase that. Um, however, um, they, they had some challenges in terms of the patient population. Um, they had a lot of intubated patients in the PICU and they, they wanted to pick something that would um, be easy uh, for the nurses to use. Um, to start with, um, but there's only a small percentage of patients in critical care that were non-intubated. So they thought they would uh, start with something that was less complex, um, or start, sorry, with a less complex patient population, and they would work with a very specific, well-defined population, so it would be non-intubated patients, um, and they would develop the nurse's pain assessment skills using both self-report and behavioral and observational scales before they maybe went on to something more complex. Um, and there was talk at the beginning when they talked about um, doing pain assessment that they might move on to something like the comfort scale once they had sort of mastered the, the flack and the faces pain scales on sort of this well-defined patient population that they could go on to something a little bit more complex like the comfort scale and use their intubated patients. Now the the environment in, the, in this critical care unit probably isn't that different than other critical care um, units. Um, this one had a high staff turnover. They had a lot of really uh, quite junior staff. Um, of course, there's high patient acuity. That led to high stress in this environment. Um, the culture in this unit was um, highly influenced by the physicians. Um, leadership was more or less ambivalent towards the study. There weren't overly supportive, I guess. Um, the atmosphere was quite uns a lot of uncertainty and a lot of that was because there had been lots of restructuring at a provincial and um, regional level um, as well as uh, within the unit. Uh, the RPC itself um, 
was reinvented four times. We had lots of turnover in the RPC membership. So people would leave for maternity leave or leave for other positions. Um, and then other new members would come on. So there was a lot of instability there and, and there was not a lot of consistency in, in messages and, and communication. Um, actually cycle one of this in this unit was completely abandoned because there was just people people weren't coming to meetings and people actually left the RPC en masse at one point. <laughs> um, none of the original RPC members were on the RPC at the end of cycle four. So that just sort of, sort of shows you how um, unstable this group was. And I'm just going to show you some um, visual examples of the kind of strategies we used to um, promote the flack and faces um, using these pain uh, tools. Um, one was the use of sort of uh, as reminders, I guess, the, the RPC would wear these very bright neon colored uh, t-shirts. And if you see the, you can see the logo on there, it says, give us flack with the new faces of pain. It was kind of their clever way of working in the two, um, the two pain scale names into the into their logo and everything that had that had to do with this study and this um, initiative had this logo on it and they also used the lime green color the neon green so that it would be very uh, easy to see and you know pick out on a on a poster we also had <clears throat> lanyard cards which had the flak scale and that's the lower one um, uh, that you can see there and the faces pain scale on the on the top and these were just basically reminders. They weren't actually meant, like the faces one wasn't actually meant to be used with patients because it was too small. It was just meant to be on the lanyard card as a reminder and just for, for uh, staff to uh, refer to. Um, we had quizzes um, and uh, if staff filled out a quiz, they could enter a contest and win. I think we had a coffee basket from Second Cup. Um, we had stickers that staff would wear, again, in the lime green color with the logo on. We had uh, Timmy, Tim Hortons, uh, where we would bring in just as reminders as well, just to sort of keep them, um, you know, thinking about the study. Um, we also, in one of the cycles, produced this laminated uh, bedside information sheet about pain and pain assessment and just giving them sort of the main points about uh, the two scales that we were, we were using. Um, in the fourth um, cycle, we we um, we did something a little different. We did some big posters, and every week we would do um, we would take a different pain myth, and we would bust it. And so we called it MythBusters, just like the TV show. So we would take a different myth, and then we would um, you know. And, and this is an example, children become accustomed to pain or painful procedures and then below it we would have um, why this isn't true and show the, the evidence to the contrary, why, you know, why this is, is a myth. Now in this unit what worked actually, <laughs> in this unit um, what worked best was actually a force change. Um, in this unit they have electronic Chart, an electronic charting system and um, when the study started the flak and the faces revised scales were not on the electronic charting system um, and we had those put on the charting system so that they could not be removed because at one point they were removable. Um, once we got that done there was a lot more evidence of these um, these scales being used or these tools being used. Um, unfortunately a forced change even though it is a way to change worked really well. Um, we also uh, had some limited success with the bedside uh, educational posters, the one I showed with the little girl on it, and the lanyard cards as well. What didn't work were the posters, emails, um, the contests, the in-services, and the one-on-one -on -one teaching. The one-on-one -on -one teaching, although it's a really great way to um, to get information across, we found that the staff just in the RPC just didn't have time to do it. Um, you know, the, the few people that they were able to get to got excellent teaching, but it just wasn't, they weren't able to cover enough staff uh, doing those things. And the in-services we found just weren't very well attended. Um, emails, nobody read emails. Um, posters, people pretty much ignored posters. And there's just too much information on the walls as is. Now in the surgical unit, um, they tackled um, pain um, treatment. Now in cycle one, their aim statement was that they would like 35% of their post-surgical patients to receive nighttime PRN pain medication routinely during the first 24 to 48 hours post-surgery. 
as evidenced by the documentation of these medications in the medical administration record. Um, by the end of their study in cycle four, they actually had changed quite a bit because they had um, they were able to reach their goals. They started uh, every cycle, they would change it a little bit. So by cycle four, they changed it to, by the end of cycle four, 80% of all patients will receive documented pre-assessment to determine need and post-assessment to determine effectiveness for PRN pain medication administration. And you're probably wondering why they chose that. Well, they found that when surgical patients were being mobilized in the morning, um, they were experiencing pain and the, this inability to mobilize was impacting length of stay. Um, patients were not being given PRN pain medication during the overnight period and they thought that um, waking patients um, to give the pain medication during the uh, night shift would make them better, um, would, would allow them to be better mobilized in the morning. Um, and this was for a, a subset of patients that were not receiving around-the-clock pain medication or PCA. So it was patients that had um, a certain, ty certain types of surgical procedures or surgeries that didn't require around-the-clock pain medication. So in cycle one, the first strategy was one-on-one -on -one teaching, which was very effective but difficult to do because of the time constraints. Um, the RPC wore t-shirts with a logo, um, and handed out lanyard cards to staff. It was effective, again, but time consuming. Um, cycle two, um, they, we did posters and uh, a Tim Hortons draw, uh, did paper-based education with a quiz. Um, we did a parent poster at bedside and um, um, medical administration record dividers. And those last two were the most successful and I'll just show you examples of them. Um, the t-shirt, and they had a logo that was pain grows while you sleep which was on everything that had to do with the study. So that, that branding of everything, you know, as soon as they saw that, that logo, they would know it was part of the study. Um, everything they had went on neon yellow in this case, so uh, it would show up. And this laminated parent poster at bedside sort of uh, was, it was meant for parents because they found there was a bit of resistance from parents in terms of waking their child up at night. The parents didn't understand why the nurse was waking their child up. Uh, to give them pain medication. So this was um, to educate parents as to why they were doing this. And if you'll notice in the sort of bottom right-hand corner, it says, please discuss your, parent, your child's pain uh, management with your nurse. So it was also an invitation for discussion with the nurse about pain uh, management with the child as well. Uh, we had a staff quiz for a prize as well, and just sort of extra educational opportunity for staff. Um, this one was meant as a reminder. So this was placed right in the MAR, <clears throat> right where the PRN, PRNs were. So um, the, the divider between the around-the-clock medication and the, and the PRNs, we had this laminated um, reminder sheet that's sort of just asking them, you know, have you done all that you can to keep your patient's pain under control and consider giving PRN pain medication during the night, just as a reminder. It was right where they were looking at the medication anyway, so we tried to get it the message as close to where they would be using um, the medication as possible. So in cycle three, um, we did some audit and feedback and, and gave uh, the information back to staff. We had some stickers that said, rate it, write it, because the focus was more now on assessing pain before and after um, uh, giving the PRN pain medication. So we want to make sure they were giving it appropriately and um, or um, making sure it was assessed after. We had a med room poster, uh, a giant one, right above the Pixis machine, right where you get the analgesics. And then um, patient chart privacy covers, and I'll show you examples of that. And then probably the, the I thought, the most inventive of all the um, um, strategies we had was the acrylic tabletops and with posters underneath. Now there's two areas in this unit where the nurses would do their charting. There's sort of two wings and each wing had a little area where the, there was a table where the nurses would do their charting. So they suggested that we get a, a, like a, a glass or an acrylic cover for the table and be able to, would allow us to slide um, messages or you know sheets or posters or whatever underneath the clear plastic or, or glass. Well we sort of ruled out glass because that would be too dangerous um, so we we went with um, heavy acrylic so 
we uh, measured the tables and, and had some acrylic cut and put it on the tables and uh, then we developed some posters that went underneath the acrylic so that where they did their charting there would be messages right underneath on the table that would um, you know give them whatever message I guess would be important at the time so during this campaign it was about what we called the golden hour um, about pain uh, assessment of pain after um, giving the PRN pain medication and I'll give you some show you some examples this is the uh, large wall poster in the med room the rate it and write it and this is the patient chart privacy cover so on the front we would have um, the logo and just you know reminding them to assess pain before and after PRN pain medication it would have the bed uh, number and then on directly on the back of that would be information about you know why we're assessing pain when to assess pain about the different tools used to assess pain and just you know information about the different scales and then these are the posters that we had um, underneath the acrylic table covers so just something catchy you know uh, funny um, you know just something that they would notice um, what worked in this unit was the visible and fun messages. Um, proximity of the messages was very important. Getting it near the point of use, like where they were doing their charting, was important for documentation. Putting uh, messages near where they got the uh, medication, and like in the medication room or in the MAR, were important. Um, audit and feedback, we found, really tapped into the competitive spirit on the unit, especially with the unit manager. Um, what didn't work, uh, again, same as in the other unit, emails, newsletters, memos, um, posters just didn't work because those things tend to get ignored. There's just too many of them. Um, overall, what have I learned from the study? Well, I've learned there's no cookie cutter solutions to doing knowledge translation, that's for sure, and that context really does matter. I think when you're trying to plan KT strategies for a unit, it's really important to look at um, the context of the unit, what sort of unit, what sort of patients, what sort of staff you've got. Um, it's definitely um, more beneficial or it'll probably be better if you get input from the staff in terms of what sort of strategies you do. Instead of imposing things, um, as the last line says, empower them to uh, find their own solutions and, and support them in that. Um, definitely pay attention to what the needs and preferences are of the individual unit. I have to say that the biggest um, barrier in both cases on both units seem to be lack of time and maybe lack of resources in terms of human resources. They, they just didn't have time a lot of um, a lot of the time to to get to meetings or to to just have the time to produce posters or or you know do those kinds of things. Um, they relied on the nurse uh, facilitator that would be me <laughs> to do a lot of the work so it was it was difficult for them to to be able to um, carry out a lot of those activities um, what would I do differently um, I didn't actually start as the research nurse um, on this project right from the very beginning and that was um, that was unfortunate because I think it would have been better to have um, consistency in terms of the nurse starting right from the very beginning of the study but that was that couldn't have been helped um, the challenges of being a university based nurse versus a hospital based nurse um, in terms of my credibility I think in terms of how the nurses viewed me I think um, I think it it's easier to get buy-in from staff if you are um, a hospital-based nurse versus a research nurse based out of the university. I think I was looked at as a bit of an outsider and I think that that um, development of relationships does make a difference. Um, how the individual research practice council members were picked um, or volun chosen <laughs> makes a difference. Um, are they truly volunteers? Were they chosen by um, management? Um, do they represent the informal leadership within the unit? Do other staff look up to these people? You know, are are they really doing it because they believe in 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 making a change in of uh, the practice on the unit? Um, the people that that do take the reins, they need to be. Um, represent different professions within the unit, different viewpoints, different levels of experience and to have the respect of their peers and be committed to the cause and the cause being whatever practice change that you're you're looking at. And thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry about that. So as Kim said, my name is uh, Dee Wilson, and I will be presenting the BC piece of the study. Um, I decided to follow Kathy's lead and title my presentation <laughs> um, also with a classic novel um, as well. So my presentation is called uh, Through the Looking Glass, Facilitating Knowledge Translation as an Insider and Outsider. Um, I use this title because when I first began the project, um, I had the unique position in that I was an insider with one of my units, NICU, because I'm actually also a bedside nurse there. But I was an outsider with my other unit, PICU, because I had never even stepped foot into the unit prior to the study. Um, so this kind of gave me the unique perspective in that I sort of knew the culture and, and uh, staff of one of my units, um, but not the other. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So I'll begin first by giving a, a brief summary of our hospital. So the Children and Women's Health Center of BC, it's located in central Vancouver. Um, it's a tertiary care center for children and women. It is two separate hospitals, so it's BC Women's and BC Children's. Um, so they are separate in certain ways. For example, they each have their own um, foundation. However, both hospitals um, are research hospitals and they're connected to the, to the University of British Columbia. So I'll start with one of my units, um, NICU, um, one of my intervention units, which is also where I work. So the NICU is a 60-bed unit. Um, it's a, a tertiary center, and it cares for the sickest babies in the province. So our NICU uh, Research Practice Council, um, I unfortunately wasn't part of the study when this council was chosen, so I'm not entirely sure how the council was chosen, but from my understanding, it was as Kathy sort of said, chosen, where it was sort of volunteer, but a little bit chosen as well. Um, the NICU RPC was made up of many disciplines. So there was a bedside nurse, um, there was a neonatologist to give medical input, and there was nursing leadership. <clears throat> um, we also had what I'm calling an expert in pain, uh, Dr. Lisa Holstey, who is actually a PhD in occupational therapy. Um, she also is the creator of the BIP tool, which is the tool that the unit um, decided to implement, and I'll get to that a bit later as well. So prior to Tropic, um, NICU did not have any pain assessment or management system um, in their unit. So as I said, one of the RPC members, Dr. Holstey, had created a validated pain assessment tool for infants called the Behavioral Indicators of Infant Pain, or the BIP score. Thus, the NICU um, RPC decide to focus one component of their targeted pain practice change on use of the BIP score for pain assessment. And they also decided to focus on providing um, non-nutritive, or sorry, non-pharmacological comfort measures, so which included non-nutritive sucking, facilitative tucking, and skin-to-skin -skin care during um, some procedures, so IV starts, blood work, and uh, endotracheal suctioning. The RPC felt that these comfort measures were good choices because many of the nurses were already using such practices, and so really a large change in culture wouldn't be needed. Um, and, and these comfort measures could be provided by both the nurse um, or the parent, except for, of course, skin-to-skin -skin care, which would only be provided by the parent, or the, the, yeah, the parent. So the NICU um, had a variety of knowledge translation strategies. So they first started off with an online module um, for the NIC staff to learn about the BIP tool. And these were implemented in education days. So in our unit, um, we have about four or five ed days a year, which are mandatory for nurses to go to. So this module was quite useful because in a way it was sort of forced learning because nurses have to go to ed days. Um, another strategy that the RPC used was BIP info card posters, which essentially was just the BIP tool um, put in the care plans of each of the um, at, at each of the bedsides. So this was useful because they were easily accessible. But that said, the nurses did not always use them. So this is just the, an example of uh, the BIP tool and the card that was placed at uh, each of the care plans. So another strategy the um, RPC did was making a pamphlet on comfort measures, and this was actually piggybacked on one of the projects that um, one of the clinical nurse leaders, who was now our unit manager, was doing at the time for one of her course for her coursework for a, a nursing course that she was taking. So the, the this nurse had made a, a pamphlet on pain and comfort measures, and so the RPC sort of helped her out with it, 
and was able to sort of tailor it for their aim statement. And this um, pamphlet was put in each of the admission packages and in the parent lounge. Um, and it was put there because, again, they wanted to include parents in providing comfort measures. Um, the NICURPC also had two uh, launch parties, pizza parties for staff. Um, and these were very useful because they were fun. They were a good platform to kind of get everyone together and talk about what the RPC was doing. Um, they also invited parents and they invited the lab technicians um, because they were also essential to providing the comfort measures. And they, they again, they did this party twice um, just because it was very um, seen as very useful. I mean, everybody likes free pizza. Um, another strategy was um, the use of a digital picture frame, um, which had a PowerPoint presentation, just sort of informing parents about how they could get involved in providing comfort measures. And this um, frame is in the family lounge, and to this day, it still sort of rotates the, the presentation. So again, it was useful because when parents were sitting in the, in the lounge, they could just sort of look at it and, and get some information. Um, and then the, the RPC also did a series of parent tea and learns um, where they essentially just advertised to parents um, to come in, have some tea and talk about, again, comfort, comfort measures they could provide to their baby and, and um, about pain management. Again, this wasn't seen as very useful just because it was a, a very low turnout. Parents, I guess, you know, are stressed and obviously have other things to do, so they didn't, um, the attendance was quite low. Um, so we also did a lot of audit and feedback, some informal and some formal. This is just an example of some of the informal audits done um, by the, the previous research nurse. And this was just put up in the nursery um, just so staff could see how they were doing and what um, the RPC was working on. Uh, this is an example of another audit and feedback that was put in the nursery. Um, this was sort of more geared towards reminding nurses to document. So there was a lot of sort of discussion around um, the fact that comfort care measures were being done in the unit. However, they weren't being documented. So this was a poster sort of reminding nurses to give themselves credit when you give comfort care to document it. Another strategy used by the NICU RPC was embedding the VIP score and the comfort measures in the nurses' notes. So this here is just the piece of the nurses' notes. Um, where they, when, the, when new nurses' notes were coming out or being made, they added a little portion of VIP score and comfort measures just to sort of serve as a reminder for nurses to every hour as they would be documenting their vital signs to also keep a VIP score and comfort measures in mind and to document it if they had provided it or done a score. This is just the poster of the launch party that was uh, done twice. So some other KT strategies done by the unit was uh, Dr. Holstie. She presented about sucrose um, and other comfort measures in the Ed Days, and this was seen as very useful just because Dr. Holstie is sort of seen as, you know, an expert in pain, and so it was a good opportunity for the nurses to ask questions from a source that was um, credible. Um, another KT strategy done by the RPC was making the BIP score a part of the rounds checklist. So this actually was um, a hospital-wide initiative looking at patient rounds on all of the units. And so from this initiative, the NICU sort of created this rounds checklist, which essentially is um, a checklist of topics that have to be discussed during rounds. So the BIP score was made part of this, just so that a discussion of the score and pain management and pain assessment would be done during rounds. Um, initially, it was quite useful. Dr. Holstey also came on rounds just to sort of remind nurses to be looking at the BIP score. Initially, it was useful, but then as rounds became longer, as they do, it sort of kind of went by the wayside a bit. Um, the R RPC also did a Teamworks pub publication, which is just a newsletter. Um, it was somewhat useful, but it was hard to kind of gauge who had read it and who hadn't. Um, this is just an example of a poster that was put up in the unit, just sort of showing all three different types of comfort care measures and how they could be provided. Um, this, again, is just an example of an informal audit. This um, We were hoping to do a bit of shock therapy, I guess, just to show the, the staff how comfort care measures really weren't being documented. Um, so these sort of informal audits were sort of done regularly just to show the, the unit how they were doing. Um, so just... Um, some more audit and feedback, just sort of showing the trend between the cycles, how they were doing, um, and what they needed to work on. 
So in summary, so NICU um, responded to a variety of strategies that were fun and engaging. They liked to do a variety of different things, as I just showed you. Um, they like to do strategies where they re nurses receive a token of, of, of appreciation for their participation. Um, they like to do things that were fine and a little bit out of the box. Um, it definitely helped that the research nurse, myself, was also a bedside nurse. Um, so as a result, I sort of knew the culture of the unit. I knew what would work, what wouldn't work. Um, I had a rapport with both the RPC and the staff. Um, the staff knew me, and so they took what I said as... Some, had some credibility to it. Um, they also liked uh, informal teaching sessions, so sort of one-on-one -on -one teaching sessions to, re to reiterate information, but they also liked larger ed days for presenting information. So overall, this unit did very well, um, but they tapered a little bit in the final cycle. So now I'll talk about my other unit, the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, the PICU. Um, so the PICU is a 22-bed unit. Um, it consists of two units, I guess, um, the ICU, which is the intensive care unit, um, which is 14 beds, and then the TCU, which is the transitional care unit, which is eight beds. Um, and TCU is sort of a step-down unit, and, but both, both units were involved in our study. So the ICU Research Practice Council um, consisted of a clinical nurse specialist, a clinical nurse leader, a clinical fellow, although this clinical fellow, she was sort of more... Um, kind of in the background, I guess, just because she had so many other priorities, so she was unable to attend a lot of meetings. Um, the QI leader and a pharmacist. So I was, again, not really sure how this RPC came about because I wasn't part of the study at the time. Um, however, you'll notice that there was, unfortunately, no bedside nurse, um, which would have, I think, been useful to this unit, um, just to get some input, input from someone who was actually at the bedside. Um, so prior to this, prior to their aims, there was a hospital-wide initiative kind of on pain um, that was going on. And so ICU sort of thought about what was happening in their unit um, to come up with their objectives. Um, so the first part of their aim, aim statement for uh, pain management was the use of an algorithm, which I'll show you later on. Um, and it's essentially this algorithm would allow nurses more autonomy on how they manage their um, patients' pain. And then the second was the use of a MAPS and SBS score for um, um, pain uh, assessment. And this, these scores focused on both pain and sedation. So I see, I see UKT. Um, so they really liked small informal teaching sessions. This usually just um, consisted of the QI leader sort of going around to each of the bedsides and doing um, sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, teaching sessions. And they found this quite useful. They also had this workshop, um, Pediatric Critical Care Continuing Continued Compet Competency Session, Does It Have to Hurt Minimizing Pediatric Pain? Again, I wasn't unfortunately part of the study at that time, so I don't have a lot of input about this workshop. Um, there was also, as I said, an IMPROVE project, which is the hospital-wide uh, QI initiative that was going on on pain. Um, therefore, it sort of pain was on the forefront, so they were able to use all KT strategies um, could piggyback on both the, the IMPROVE project and the study were able to piggyback each other. And then as part of the hospital-wide rounds um, initiative, they also included SBS and MAPS as part of their rounds checklist. This was deemed very, very useful um, just because I see the, the culture of the unit is they take rounds quite, are, they're quite uh, rigid and rounds are very structured um, and so they tend not to deviate from the checklist. Um, this is just an example of some audit and feedback that was done, and as you can see, from baseline to cycle two, how well they had done um, in pain assessment. And this, again, is just an example, just showing a trend um, between the cycles of how uh, ICU did, and this was fed to the staff just so they could see how they were doing. This is uh, the algorithm that they tried to implement in the unit. You can see it's, it's a little bit busy, but essentially it's just uh, looking at pain and sedation and according to what's happening with the patient, um, the, pain, the nurse would, would take a certain course of action. So in the final cycle, um, it was sort of found that the algorithm was not the best um, aim statement to have essentially because it was very difficult to audit. Um, you couldn't tell from the nurse's notes whether a nurse had taken a certain course of action because she was following the algorithm or, or if she had done so just because of an order. 
Um, so in the final cycle, the ICU decided to change its aim statement. And instead, they um, focused on seeing whether the SBS and MAP scores done by the nurses were correlating with those that were ordered by the doctors. So in summary, um, ICU liked very simple strategies. Uh, they did not like to do very many or a variety of strategies. They essentially stuck to sort of one-on-one -on -one teaching sessions. Um, the culture of the unit was such that they did not support any type of rewards or parties. Um, they were just very strictly against that. Um, they also liked to implement their own KT strategies and did not like a lot of interference from the research nurse. Um, so overall, overall, however, they did extremely well and their aims were met. Um, so final thoughts, I definitely would say that each unit was very, very different, but their style worked for them. I learned that it's important to understand the style and allow each RPC to work with it. So it wasn't appropriate for me to suggest parties or rewards for the ICU RPC, knowing that that style didn't work for them. Um, and I also learned that establishing a rapport and relationship, as Kathy said, um, with each unit is essential for success. Um, for NICU, it was very helpful that I was a bedside nurse there. So as a, as a result, I was an insider. Um, with ICU, it, it took a little bit of time. Um, it helped when ICU nurses knew I was a practicing bedside nurse in NICU. Um, eventually, as they saw more of me during data collection, they sort of knew of me and I wasn't considered an outsider. And that definitely helped. So thank you very much. And I think we're going to head back over to uh, Kim and Melanie in Toronto. And that just gives also gives me a chance to remind everyone uh, to be sure to uh, start typing in your questions, as I think uh, uh, Melanie and Kim are going to bring us a little bit more uh, content, and then uh, we're going to be opening it up for the discussion. So feel free to, to type in your questions at any time. Great, thanks Doug, and thank you very much Kathy and Dee. So I'm just going to, um, Kathy and Dee both talked about sort of their own lessons learned, and we actually had the opportunity last week to bring together all of the clinical research coordinators, except two, um, to talk about sort of their common experiences across all of the sites. So what I'm going to share with you now are sort of the, the highlights of what that group came up with. So as you heard from both Kathy and Dee, the relationship between the clinical research coordinator and the staff was really crucial. Um, a lot of the research nurses had worked, did work on one of the units that they were involved with, which certainly gave them a bit of an advantage. And others had to, um, were completely new to the institution, so they had to work very hard to get to know both of the units. Um, so either way, it, it really took a lot of work and that that whole relationship was really important to how the whole um, KT strategies um, played out. They also both talked about uh, getting the right RPC members and um, as they said, some were volunteers, some were more sort of chosen. Ideally, those who volunteered had a greater uh, sort of commitment and interest in the, in the study and in being involved in enacting those practice changes. The involvement of staff nurses uh, was an issue sometimes. So uh, as you heard on one of these units, there were no staff nurses involved at all. And on one of the other units, actually in another at another site, by the end of the study, the entire RPC was made up of staff nurses. The problem then though, was that the staff nurses didn't uh, usually had to use their own time to come in for meetings, to actually carry out some of the KT strategies, whereas someone like a clinical nurse specialist or in a different or an educator type role, it was built into their role to do education for staff and to have time to attend meetings. So, so there were kind of pros and cons both, um, both ways to having staff nurses, um, but generally it was important to have at least a few staff nurses as part of the RPC. Uh, as well, thinking about if the practice change affected another profession. So for example, if you were trying to increase the use of sucrose on a unit, pharmacy needed to be involved because maybe they didn't have the ability to provide enough sucrose or needed to be aware that there was going to be this sudden increase in the use of sucrose. So it was helpful for them to be involved uh, in the RPC in some way to uh, be able to facilitate that. Similarly around uh, lab, uh, if 
the practice change centered on lab work that was being done, then it was helpful to have them involved. Having staff buy into the practice change. Um, as uh, Kathy and Dee talked about a bit, uh, it was important that whatever practice changes were chosen fit with what the staff thought was an important piece for the unit. Uh, one suggestion was that in, in, if this was study was to be done again, or if you were going to implement this on your own unit, that maybe three or four practice changes are chosen or potential practice changes. And then those are circulated to the staff and you have some kind of a vote to see which one the staff feels is most important and that should help with some more of their buy-in. Uh, similarly, having staff really involved from the beginning of the process so they feel a part of it, uh, both in terms of determining the, those aim statements as well as what strategies will actually be done. Uh, seamless integration, so this idea of not doing anything too complex that completely changes the way that people are practicing. Uh, and that included the KT strategies as well. Things needed to be just sort of seamlessly integrated into whatever infrastructure was already there. Uh, and another piece was just really thinking about baby steps. So, so the process of implementing these changes and working uh, sharing knowledge about how things maybe could and should be done uh, was an important achievement. And if it didn't always sort of show up in the, the audit and feedback scores, at least uh, they were making baby steps towards making those changes. So the idea of, you know, if you're not reaching your goals on the first try, don't get discouraged, but really be reflective about how things have gone, what were the challenges, what worked, what didn't, and then really be creative in determining the next steps. So in terms of the, the significance of uh, this casebook and the, the study, we hope that our casebook can be used as a guide on how to select and implement the most effective strategies to improve the assessment and management of procedural pain in infants, children, and adolescents. And our casebook will be housed on a website that we plan to launch uh, hopefully early in the fall. And and the casebook will be there, which will be the kind of information that we've presented to you now, but also there will be toolkits of resources to help uh, uh, people to assist in understanding more about what EPIC is, the intervention that we used, as well as tools for actually implementing EPIC. So we'll post updates uh, along with this, the archive of this webinar about uh, when those additional resources are available. So now that you've heard a bit more about what a casebook is, uh, we wanted to just ask a poll question in terms of, do you like this idea of hearing this sort, these sort of frontline stories about how these practice changes were implemented? And do you like the casebook model for sharing this kind of information? And your options are yes, not sure, or you, you don't see the benefit of this. All right, so we've got 82% have said yes, they do like the casebook model, and 18% have, have said not sure, and no one said that they don't see the benefit. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you see some benefit. Uh, great. So then our next question is, uh, would you like to actually see more casebooks? And the, the idea is that, so this casebook that we're working on now is um, presents information from sort of the initial uh, implementation of EPIC, but, but the subsequent study that's actually in progress now is, so these practice changes were made, but how are those sustained over time? And looking at um, methods to ensure that those practices are sustained. So we're already in talks to do casebook part two to uh, share information about sort of that sustainability piece. So again, now that you've heard a bit more about what a casebook is like, do you think uh, this is uh, effective. Would you like to see more casebooks? Yes, not sure, or no. Uh, so we've got 97% uh, have said yes, they want to see more casebooks. And then so that even some of the people who are not sure about uh, the benefits, they, they still want to see more. So that's good. <laughs> Great. We can continue on. Uh, so just to finish off, uh, of course, this was obviously a huge study uh, with all these multiple sites. To, so just to 
acknowledge the, the other sites that took part and the investigators that have taken part, uh, as well as, uh, of course, the CIHR who funded uh, all of this work, and for myself, who's also uh, funded by CIHR and, uh, and an Elizabeth Dixon KT Fellowship Supplement. So we'll open it up there, actually, to any questions. Uh, and of course, thank you as well to Doug and CAFC for allowing us to share this information with everybody. Oh, it's certainly and our pleasure. Like no, we, it's, uh, this has been a, a very popular content. A wide range of our members across the continuum of care are participating today from acute care centers, rehab centers, and everything. So it's, it's certainly our pleasure to, uh, to be a part of this. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one uh, that came in quite early on was uh, was from Bonnie, and she asked, "Can pictures be included in the case book?" And she's suggesting that that would be very helpful. And if I would go on to suggest that maybe even since you're doing this in an online version on a website, that perhaps even uh, if po if possible, you know, video and links and other uh, types of information as well, documents and images and that sort of thing might all be very useful to help enhance a, a case book like this. Right. So most of the case books to date have essentially been done as PDF. Uh, files. Very text heavy. Yeah, very text heavy. Um, so yes, our plan is that since this will be on a website that we have much more flexibility to be able to, in the text, then have a link to say, you know, here we use posters in our, as one of our KT strategies, and then you would click on posters and that would bring up some examples of the posters. So, um, as well as, yes, potentially videos. It's unlimited. We're hoping to make this casebook as interactive as possible so it's most useful for anybody who wants to try and make similar changes in their practice. Um, the next question that came in was, uh, how did, was, this would be for, for both Kathy and Dee, uh, how did both nurse researchers evaluate what uh, was useful or what worked versus what didn't? So what was the, the process that you used to evaluate those? Um, uh, can I go ahead, Dee? <laughs> we, we, had, um, we had some paperwork that we had to do at the end of each cycle that the RPC had to fill out. So they actually had to do a rating amongst themselves of how they felt, it's basically on a Likert scale kind of thing, where they would rate how well they thought it did. So it was the RPC themselves that determined that. And Dee, did you have anything to add to that? No, that's exactly what I was going to say, Evie. Uh, it was called a process evaluation checklist. Um, it was just, yep. as Kathy said, these little uh, forms that we filled out yep. um, kind of at the end of each cycle. The RPC rated them. So these are not our ratings. They are the RPC's ratings of whether they were deemed useful or not. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question, and I can't remember which of uh, Kathy or Dee, who, which of you mentioned the comfort scale, but she's asking, what is the comfort scale? Uh, and what assessment parameters does it involve? Um, it was me, Kathy. <laughs> um, I'm not a critical care nurse, but I believe the comfort scale um, involves some um, biophysical measurements like heart rate, respiration, and also some um, some movement as well. I think it's a combination of some biophysical and um, observational uh, together in one. So it's, it's used for um, patients in critical care, typically, that are intubated. Um, I don't know, Dee, you're, a, you're more critical care than I am. Um, that was what they were thinking might be a good one to go to because it's a little bit more complex in terms of determining, um, determining the scale. It's just a little, there's a little bit more to it than like faces where it's all observational. They thought that one might be a little bit more difficult to start the nurses out on because there's just a bit more to it and they thought well let's get them used to something a little bit more straightforward before we go to something like that but I believe it's it's got a combination of biophysical and observational indicators all right I know if someone else can add to that I like I said I'm not a critical care nurse so I don't know exactly but all right well thanks Kathy um, the next question is, uh, is there comparative feedback on the cancer and cardiac units that utilized uh, current practice over the KT casebooks at the first facility? Could you repeat that again? Sorry. 
Uh, she's just asking, is there comparative feedback on the cancer and cardiac units that utilized current practice over the KT case books at the first facility? Uh, so as part of the overall study, uh, yes, data was collected on the two units at each hospital who took part in the study but just continued with their usual care. So in the, the more um, sort of scientific presentations with the results uh, from this research, that's where that kind of information is and how we showed that EPIC actually does uh, help to improve practice in these areas. All right, thank you, Dee. Um, the next question I should have uh, potentially have warned uh, you guys beforehand, we do have very strong representation from our child life specialists at these pain webinars. They've been uh, very popular and uh, Victoria is asking, can you describe what, if any, involvement child life specialists have had in your research, particularly in non-pharmacological pain management strategies? Well, this is Kathy. We had, we had a child life on one of our RPC and she was one of the most, um, she was very instrumental in, in, in getting our RPC, you know, motivated and, and going on that unit. She was, she was excellent. Um, but the, um, it was that on that unit, it was pain treatment. It was the PRN, um, pain, uh, medication administration. So she, she didn't really have a role in administering pain medication, but she did in terms of the teaching, um, about, uh, assess or, um, in terms of uh, teaching the uh, staff about the, the pain, um, you know, just the the, pa the, the parent uh, poster and just getting around to the patients each, or sorry, the, the staff individually and doing the, the teaching with them because she had more of the time versus the bedside nurses. But there was no, um, we didn't have, a, we didn't have any non-pharmacological um, pain interventions, so she, she wasn't uh, involved that way. And I think that goes back to the idea of making sure that your RPC has members on it that fit with what your practice changes are so that if a unit actually chose to focus on psychological or physical interventions, it would make sense to have uh, a child life person as well as maybe a psychologist uh, or other people on the RPC to help guide those practice changes. Yeah, it's D. Um, for ours, because we did do the comfort care measures, uh, Lisa Holstey, um, who is a uh, child developmental health scientist, she had a lot of input and she's done a lot of research um, looking at non-pharmacological comfort care measures, so it was useful to have her. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a child life um, person on either of our RPCs, and it's very unfortunate. We don't actually use them a lot in our um, NIC, which is extremely unfortunate. Um, they're used sort of more in our pediatric units, which were my standard care units, but it was helpful to have Lisa um, on our RPC for that. All right, thank you. Um, so we are just about out of time. We've got about five minutes left. So that's the uh, we that that was the last question that we had in the queue. So uh, just one more uh, one more chance for the the audience to type in a few last questions, as we do have a couple more minutes left in our scheduled time. But while we're waiting for any any last questions to come in from the audience, are, are there any other comments from uh, from any of our panelists, uh, Melanie, or Dee, or Kathy? I guess just a question to the audience. Um, because we're kind of still in the process of finalizing our casebook and pulling all the pieces together, is there any in other information that you think would be important to include in the casebook? And essentially, you've you've really heard what will be in there. Um, but it will be eight stories rather than two stories that you've heard today. Uh, but is there any other kind of information that you think would make it easier for you to then go away and actually implement some of these things in your own unit? Yeah, that's a good question for, for the audience. So if anyone, you know, while you're thinking of other questions, has any suggestions for other types of information or anything that could be added, um, you know, feel free to type it into the question box here. And if you uh, think of something after the, the webinar, uh, you can either put it in the comments section on the Knowledge Exchange Network on that page or feel free to email uh, me at dmaynard at cafc.org and I'll be more than happy to pass the information along to, uh, to our presenters here. Uh, someone has suggested pra practical ideas and suggestions, and I think that's that's very valid. You know, things that are really, uh, you, know, um, you know, things that are very specific uh, bits of information that have been applied and, and 
and are transferable across centers. I think that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we did have a question just came in from Laurel, and she's asking, will you go back to these units at a later date to see if the positive effects in pain management continue? And is that part of this, this study? So that's part of the subsequent study that's going on right now, which is called sustainability. Uh, so now it's going back and looking at these units uh, and adding an extra sort of a booster to half of the units. So there were 16 units that got the intervention and now eight of those units are getting what we call a booster to try and help them continue their practice changes. And then yes, we're going back and doing the same kind of um, audits, chart audits, to look at how things are going and see if they're being sustained on their own or are they being sustained with these booster sessions or are they not being sustained at all. So that, that will be our next uh, webinar in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and that looks like uh, the last question. I don't have any more questions coming in. So again, as I said, if you do think of something after the session, uh, Oh, someone just put in, uh, it would be helpful to include information on developmentally appropriate tools to involve the pediatric patient themselves in rating their pain. Yeah, and I, th I think um, just because of the units that were involved and the ones that we talked about today, cert well, I mean, the FACES pain scale is certainly one that involves the child in reporting their own pain. Um, but the the toolkit, which we'll have on the website that will kind of go hand in hand with this casebook, will have information about all sorts of different uh, pain assessment tools that are out there for children as well as information about what the reliability and validity and clinical utility of each of those are so that people can have a spot to go to to see what might be best for the patients on their unit. Mm -hmm. And someone is also along that pain scale uh, piece is, is suggesting that dis uh, including descriptions of the scales and the psychometric properties of the scales used in each study so they can look at their relevance in their for their own areas of practice. Right, so I think on the, on the website um, that would be a, a very helpful piece to have sort of the links back to the original research that was done around the different tools that we will highlight. Uh, as well as having sort of the plain language summary about what that research actually says, because some of that uh, work to look at the reliability and validity of an instrument is pretty dense and overwhelming. <laughs> um, so, so yes, having some plain language summaries around that kind of information so that people know what they're what they're getting. All right, and that looks like the last one, and we are pretty much out of time, right at one o'clock here, uh, Eastern time, anyways. Um, so uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap up. So I'll, uh, if there's any other l final closing comments from our from our uh, panel, uh, just to say thank you very much to everyone for being with us today, and thank you to Dee and Kathy for um, sharing their firsthand knowledge and experience on the the units and at the health centers where they are. Um, thank you to Melanie Barwick who really was the person who suggested a KT casebook because I'd certainly never heard of one before I started this. Um, and we will keep you posted on when the actual casebook goes live on our website in the fall. And we hope that you will come back and, and make use of it. So thank you very much. All right, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, it's been a, it's been, as I mentioned earlier, it's been great being part of this work. It's been very valuable and a lot of positive feedback from our, from the CAFC and the child and youth health community. So thank you again to uh, the CIHR team in Children's Pain and for to CIH, CIHR for funding all of this work, and for involving us and letting us be a part of it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this session has been recorded and will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, probably will be up early next week. And any other information that the team sends my way as far as uh, when, when this website is up with the case books and the other tools that they, the toolkit that they've described, when that's available, we will certainly try and send uh, that information out and let people know through our various communication channels. Uh, so with that uh, being said, we're going to say goodbye to everyone and thank you for coming and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thanks everyone. <laughs>